Good morning and welcome. Good morning. It is wonderful to be back at home at Ed Shell and with you for worship this morning. I heard that um, Bob Coleman had a wonderful experience worshiping again at Ed Shell. He's such a talented man. So I'm so glad he could be here and have a, a homecoming of sorts. Important announcement, and I just sent an email reminder out earlier this morning that the NOAA annual meeting is today, 3 o'clock. Um, historically, Ed Hill has been so well represented at this annual meeting. It's, um, we want to encourage anyone who can attend to attend today. It's it, Bill? Um, thank you, John, for, for mentioning Noah. I wanted to get a show of hands. I'm going to have to stand up and say how many people we brought. And I want to see who's planning to go. There's no online, there's no Zoom. No, they're, Zoom. apparently no, not. I, I thought maybe they were thinking about doing a Zoom, but I. Uh, Bill, I read that they're doing a Facebook Live. Yeah. Okay, okay. They are yeah. going to. Glad yeah. they want people there in person to have a strong physical yeah. presence in front of our elected officials. Good answer. Thank you. Do you got my email on my record? I did. I did. Yeah. Where? And where? It's, look, look on the board back here, Jefferson Street Baptist, 3 o'clock. But um, all the information is there, and I sent an email out this morning. Um, work day is next Saturday, Saturday morning. We're going to clean up around here. I did notice that a lot of work was done while I was out of town. I noticed all the vines are off the building, 1416, that were covering that one side. Um, so there must have been some, like, elves out after the cover of darkness doing some work. Thanks, Ed. I know who the elf was, Ed Wilkinson. <laughs> Um, any other announcements? Of course, yes, Paul, the recycle bag. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just, if you have to choose between the two, go come work here next Saturday morning, but there is the an annual recycle day uh, that's being held at West End United Methodist Church, and there are some flyers back there that give the details just to make sure that you bring the right stuff and don't bring the wrong stuff. But it's document shredding, electronics, medis old medicines, that's what if we time things right, we can do some clean out of some storage rooms here and take them directly to West End for to be recycled, a lot of the electronics. And, uh, we have closets that haven't been cleaned out in 30 years, so there's, there's plenty to go. If there's nothing else, I invite you to take in that deep cleansing breath. Center your hearts and minds, and let's worship together.
join me in our call to worship. We have encountered the word calling us into communion with God and with each other. And calling us into discipleship to carry on Christ's word in our world. So we come together here, joining hands in the great quest to worship God, to love each other, and to serve the world. Our first hymn is Morning Has Broken, number 145 in the Red Hymn Line. If you will stand as you're able in body or spirit. Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In your arms, O God, we find rest. Thanks be to God. Amen. to invite anyone who has a joy or a prayer concern to lift that up and share it with us at this point. I have a dog 
Yes, sir. It's good to have the pastor and Marsha back from the state trip. Thank you. Thank you. Dean said it was good to have the pastor and Marsha back from their vacation. Oh. It's good to be back. Roland? So, uh, Sisway is about to move down to the farm. It seems it's got all set up down there. And, uh, and uh, it's going to happen in the next week or two. So, that's very exciting. Wonderful. Yeah. His house is up for sale, and people are coming to look at it now. And uh, so, that's exciting. And then my friend Mike Tolkien is at the VA hospital. Prayers for him. Mike's at the VA hospital. Roman's friend Mike Tolan is at the VA hospital, and Sisway is very close to making the move down to the farm. It's all good news. I'm sure we lifted up families and people impacted by Hurricane Ian um, last week when we weren't here. That's been a, a devastating storm that's impacted you know thousands of families. So we want to continue to keep that in our minds and in our prayers. Paul? Now, there's so many international things that could be lifted up, but I guess on my heart this morning is, are the women of Iran um, and just their courage and trying to speak up for their human rights. Thank you, Paul. Women of Iran and international crisis across the, across the globe where there are tensions and violence and, um, and human rights violations that continue to take place. And prayers for the continuation of American democracy. Pray for our democracy. It's certainly at risk. There's, there's a threat to democracy right before our eyes. Dorothy? Barbara Cloud's brother Jim died in Bloomingdale. Barbara's brother Jim passed away. Pray for Barbara and family. Dick? Yeah, Tuesday is the last day to register to vote. Uh, I'm sure everybody here is registered, but we all have friends, unfortunately, who unfortunately uh, may not be. Anybody else we can get registered? Uh, Tuesday is the last day to register to vote. If everyone would reach out to your friends and neighbors who may not be registered and encourage them to take that step or, or take a step to help them do that. More important than ever. Then I invite you to pray silently with me. Loving God, we thank you for the wondrous ways in which you have healed and restored us. And the way you brought us together to be the body of Christ here at Edge Hill. There have been countless times when we've wondered if the trials and struggles of our lives would overcome us and swallow us up. Yet you've reached out to reassure and restore us. Just as Jesus healed the ten people afflicted with leprosy, one, when he saw that he had been healed, returned to Jesus, praising God for the healing that had taken place. Make our faith as strong as the one man who returned to give praise. Give us the wisdom to know the source of healing is not in our pleading, but in our acknowledging your love and power. As we bring before you the names and situations in our hearts that are filled with strife and trouble, we ask for your healing and care in all of our circles. We know that you hear the cries of our hearts and respond always in love. Help us to place our complete trust in your never-ending compassion. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able and let's sing the great hymn, Hymn of Promise, 
number 707.
moment before I dig into the scripture in our reading. Um, I will be here next week and the following week. Dorothy is going to be our preacher. Some people thought Dorothy was going to be here this week or next week. Just wanted to clarify that I'm here this week and next week. And then you have the privilege of hearing the most reverend Dorothy Gage. Amen. Can't hear. I will project a little more. Okay, today our reading is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 17, 11 to 19. I invite you to hear these words. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him, keeping their distance. They called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Loving God, have mercy on us as we also travel the lands in between. The lepers in the gospel story live in the shadows, in a no man's land, a region between. They're required to live in seclusion, keeping their distance from any passerbys. They certainly looked terrible with their dirty and worn clothes and unkept hair as they announced their own disease with loud, humiliating cries, unclean. So when Jesus heals their skin, he doesn't just cure their bodies. He restores their identities. He enables their return to everything that makes them fully human. Family, community, society, even intimacy. Through their healing, he frees them to live again, to embrace and be embraced, to worship in community, to reclaim all the social and spiritual ties that the disease had stolen from them. This story at first glance seems like a typical healing story for Jesus. Jesus is on his final journey toward Jerusalem. He encounters people of need, to be healed. And bam, he heals them. Then, of course, God is praised. Beautiful. Sermon's done. God can heal us from the things that keep us from community. And we should be grateful. Amen. But there's more to the story. It gets a little more interesting when we notice that God is at the center of the healing. And only one of the ten realizes it. And he alone pivots to turn back toward Jesus to give praise. Clearly, this tenth leper is the one God is using to deliver our message in today's reading. He is one of the ten who responded differently. The one who noticed something special about that moment. So maybe... The point of the story is that we should all do a better job noticing what God is doing in the world around us. We should pay more attention and then be invited to reflect on how well we notice these God moments in our lives and then express our gratitude every single day. That's pretty much the way I felt called to preach this reading early in my time at Ed Schill. But now, after six years at Ed Chill, 
I see another even deeper message in this reading that I feel called to share with you today. It's no accident that the single person who turned back to give thanks and praise was a Samaritan, an outsider. It was a Samaritan that points out the important message in our story by returning to Jesus in praise and thanksgiving in, and in recognition in recognizing God's presence. He recognized Jesus as the human face of God and our teacher. So far, our message could be one, we should better notice what, how God has acted in our lives and in the world. And two, we should recognize Jesus as the human face of God whose teachings show us where God is at work and empowers us to open our hearts to the divine presence the moment that it happens. So of course our response should always be an expression of recognition and gratitude. And most importantly, it's also the expression of a deeper and truer belonging to something much bigger than ourselves. And that's good news worth sharing because it both heals and liberates while providing us a place to belong in a meaningful purpose in our lives. And that's what Edgehill does. It's where we do belong and where our purpose is divinely driven. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. But wait, 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 wait. There's more. <laughs> There's an even deeper message that we can learn from this story by looking at this story's relationship with another story in Luke's gospel. Today's story comes after the story of the Good Samaritan, mm. the one who helped his neighbor. Remember back when Jesus first turned his face to Jerusalem in chapter 10? That's when he told his famous Good Samaritan parable. It's a parable that illustrates what it looks like to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second part of the greatest commandment that Jesus teaches. Today's story should be paired with that Good Samaritan story. And we should call today's reading the Thankful Samaritan. It illustrates what it looks like to follow the first part of the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. In other words, we love God with our entire being. And what does loving God in this way look like? It looks like thanking and praising God for giving us a place to belong and a meaningful purpose in life. It looks like having the insight and the nerve to notice, to stop, and to pivot and return in praise and in thanksgiving. These two stories, Jesus masterfully illustrates the most important essence of Jewish law by painting two pictures featuring two Samaritans, two outsiders, as the standard bearers of our faith. One merciful, the other thankful. One loving God and one loving neighbor. The power of this connection between the two stories does a couple of things. First, it reinforces the greatest commandment itself as the guidelines that Jesus himself lifted up as being the most important commandment. Secondly, when Luke identifies this 10th leper as a Samaritan, he pulled the rug out from under the expectation of his original audience. And he shocks them into a glimpse of the wideness in God's love and about who receives divine grace and who's invited to participate in God's love. Our ailing, our ailing Samaritan would have been the very last person Luke's first readers would have expected to receive God's mercy, God's healing, and grace. 
He would have been the most unlikely of persons they'd expect to gain understanding and faith. And the most unlikely of persons to have correctly noticed God's action in the world. So here we have it. Once again, the hero of our story is the most unlikely of persons who was busy demonstrating the ever-widening nature of God's welcome. This alone might be the most important and consistent message, not only in this story, but in the entirety of Scripture. And it applies to our lives just as much today as it did to Jesus' early listeners. The church throughout history has been notorious for making the circle of love smaller mm -hmm. by emphasizing petty or even meaningless things to set up barriers to participation in the community of faith. Maybe for us, we should reread this story in replacing Samaritan with whoever gets excluded today. The least expected people we would think to be receiving God's message and turning around and pivoting to give thanks. What if we read the second part of verse 16 that reads, and he was a Samaritan, and we read it as he was an atheist, or they were immigrants and refugees, or what if it read he was pagan, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, or worst of all, what if it read he was a Trump supporter? My point is, no one should be excluded from participation in God's community, the community of love and service to others. Only when the reading confronts the human tendency to exclude will it speak meaning into our lives. Maybe this is a good time for you and I to cry out ourselves, God have mercy on us. Edge Hill has been a mecca of justice and inclusion for 56 years. We began fighting for the rights of our African American neighbors during desegregation, and then soon thereafter started welcoming our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters as gifted and equal members of this community of faith. We welcomed countless HIV AIDS patients as they approached death, even helping them transition over to God with great dignity and respect in the 80s and 90s, often at times when their own families would have nothing to do with them. We fought to feed the hungry. We fought for people's home and for affordable housing. Whatever the social issue of the day was, Edgehill boldly walked in ways that served the underserved and spoke in ways that amplified the voices that simply weren't being heard. Times continue to change. We've gotten older. At this moment in history, it feels like we're traveling somewhere between Samaria and Galilee, between the Edgehill of old and the new Edge Hill. As we journey in this diverse and historic little neighborhood, it's a land in between, between Music Row and Belmont University and Vanderbilt, between 12 South and the Gulch, the land where the hipsters rule. <laughs> As we travel this in-between land, We've got to come to grips with the fact that Edge Hill is neither the neighborhood of old, nor yet the neighborhood that it will be in the future. We must be willing to listen to God and pivot and change directions in ways that welcomes those that God sends here. Edge Hill is a place where, it seems to me, if we travel where we're called to travel, God will use us as channels of welcome, mercy, and grace. And God's given us the power to step into those in-between places in people's lives where the pain of their experiences can be heartbreaking. Into those places where the lepers in today's gospel once lived 
cut off from communities of love and support. You and I can walk into those places and maybe, just maybe, that's the beginning of healing and restoration. And somehow, even just that can elicit the same kind of gratitude that we witnessed in today's reading. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able, in body or in spirit, and let's sing together number 507, Through It All.